Okay, welcome to 1,000 Ways. I'm going to tell you more why it's called 1,000 Ways, but first I want to introduce my guest here. She's my clan of panna cooking, my liebchen, my sweet pea, my honeybee, my wife of 36 years, the amazing Corolla Friesen. Yes, that Corolla Friesen, who was recently the Canadian Coach of the Year. A couple years ago. A couple years ago, Canadian Coach of the Year. We're going to talk to her about horses and humans and how they work together and how they are similar, those kind of things. But first of all, I want to tell you why this is called 1,000 Ways. Do you know? Have I told you? I think I know, but I'm going to let you tell the story better. All right. So there was this person called Rumi, really smart person, 800 years ago. Rumi said, there are 1,000 ways to kiss the earth. So this show is about collectively let finding out, let's discover that thousand ways. Matter of fact, on the last episode, Steve Dudas was on, and I think we found one of the thousand ways. I think you did too. Yeah, and mm -hmm. you know what that was? That was where Steve and I both were very grateful that we were able to attract good people into our lives. And that was a, something that we both shared and something that we were both very grateful that we were able to do that. So i got to believe that's one of the thousand ways to kiss the earth. Now you might say, why, why would you just like work at this and ask questions and listen? You know, why would you just ask Google? Yeah, there's some things that Google doesn't know. Hey Google, give me the list of a thousand ways to kiss the earth. She's not even asked, she's, answering. She's searching. Yeah. Google can't answer it. <laughs> we can answer it. Google cannot. So. Now, I want to get back to my guest. My guest is Corolla Friesen. She is, as I said, a Canadian recognized best coach across the country a couple years back. Mm -hmm. She's a rainer. She's a horse trainer. She gives lessons. She runs a boarding facility. I, I help her a little bit. She does most of everything. And so that's, that's kind of her life is all horses, all of your adult life, really. Yeah. So why horses? Why is it so special to have horses? I don't know. I was attracted to horses as a young child. Um, had horses from about age 13 on, and I'll tell you, the first horse that ever I ever owned bucked me off every chance he had. And I still, I think that's the test of a true person. If you keep riding, you love horses. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. And I'm still riding, so. Still riding. Still riding, giving lessons. Let me ask you this question. I had a, a riding lesson experience when I was young. Mm -hmm. You tell me if this is the way it should be done, okay? okay? When I was little, like five years old, my dad decided he was going to teach me how to ride a horse. So he took me to this horse. It was like 27 hands high. It was tall. That was a big horse. That's so a big that horse. Must have been like a Guinness record, record too. <laughs> a record-breaking horse? I think so, yeah. Maybe it wasn't 27. Maybe it was only 22. But it was big. Yeah. And he put me on. And I was crying before... This is a big, scary animal, stinky, and oh, it's like, you know, I'm worried, eh? And he puts me on this horse like that, and the horse takes two steps, and I fall off. I never stopped crying when I got on the horse, and I cried all the way until I hit the ground. And your dad laughed, too. And my dad laughed. I don't think that is, an, that is a favorable... That's probably not the way to go about no. getting somebody interested in horses. So how would you do that with somebody who was scared? Somebody who was scared? I did have a young student one time. Um, he came to me, and um, I had a group lesson. And nobody told me that he'd had a very similar experience, probably 20 hand high horse, but you know, when you're five years old, they all look like they're that big. And um, so the first, back then I didn't do a lot of groundwork because I only had an hour. And so we saddled up the horses and I was getting this young man on and he had a panic attack as soon as he got on the horse. So we immediately took him off. And uh, then they explained to me that he'd had a very similar experience at a um, fair, you know, with the ponies that go around in a circle. He'd been thrown from one of those ponies, and he was afraid. So for uh, it was an eight-week course, so what I did for the rest of that eight weeks was I got a volunteer to hold the horse with a step beside the horse, and I said to this young man, when you feel ready, all you have to do is put your foot in the stirrup and then get off again. And if you feel at some point that you'd like to sit in the saddle, you go for it. No rush. We're going to be over here walking around. You go ahead and do what you need to do. So he's and just sitting on the horse. He wasn't no. even sitting on the horse. Oh, no. he, it took him a little bit just to get back close to the horse. Okay. okay. So um, by the end of the eight weeks, he was walking around by him, like with a leader, but sitting on the horse, and he was feeling really comfortable. And it was because he got to do it on his term rather than somebody else's terms. That sounds like the right way to teach somebody who's scared. Yeah, it helps. 
you actually have lots of adult students, right, who are there like 50 years old and have never ridden a horse and then want to try to try it, right? Totally. Yep, yeah, I do. Yeah, for a while we had like a whole University of Lethbridge prof. We did group have there. quite a few. Yeah, we did have but quite a few. But tell me how that works for somebody like that. Is there anything different than what you would do with that young boy who was so scared? Normally, if it's your first time around a horse, then I will do some groundwork. Uh, like I'll teach you how to catch the horse, how to groom the horse, how to saddle the horse. We will go through um, how to lead the horse safely because a lot of people aren't even that comfortable on the ground with a horse. And so if they can move that horse around and get them out of their way a little bit, they feel a lot more comfortable about getting on. And they shouldn't be comfortable around. They're big, huge animals that can hurt you really they badly. They can, yeah, totally. Really, really. Totally, and I, so you need to learn what to do to control them, for sure. I've never been comfortable with not having like a shifter or a clutch mm -hmm, or yeah. an ignition switch. Because you know how When you turn the key off, they stop, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I know what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Cool. So you've told me before that sometimes horses because they're prey animals, are sort of like people who might have been um, victimized or hurt in the past kind of a thing. Right. Right, that, that people like that kind of see the world similar to horses as because horses are prey animals. Right. So they, they are always wary, all, correct? Is that so I think what you're getting at is that horses will um, reflect us a lot. And so they will, uh, if you're a comfortable person and you're, you're strong, they tend to be a little more comfortable around you if you approach a little bit more timidly, they're going to be more timid, and the, and the reason is, is because they're prey. They're always watching their environment, looking for stress or comfort or stress, you know, if something moved that didn't move, they're always watching. And so, um, if you are, like, people who've been abused often or had a tough childhood, they tend to look at the world the same way. If you're a child of an alcoholic parent, you'll come home and you'll always assess the situation when you come home, right? They're like, oh, how do I act today to keep that parent happy? And so I think that those two meet together very well because now you're um, that more, much more empathetic to the horse and how the horse is, and you're a little bit more careful than the average person might be. And you probably have a stronger connection, a stronger bond because they, you know, it's kind of where you share that perception of the world. Maybe yeah. right? it could be. A, I think the bond is just because the horse realizes that you are a little softer in your approach. You know, a predator, they go straight to a horse, right. right? And so people who walk straight to a horse, you know, a confident, broke horse that's had lots of experience, that's not a problem. But if you're approaching a young horse or, or an unhandled horse, that's going to be a problem, right? They're going to think you're going to, coming to eat them. So if you approach a little bit more looking at the ground, kind of do what I call rainbow approach, you're going to be more successful in those horses that are um, more so you're timid. Going, you're going like this kind of thing as opposed to going like right. that. Right, and not always looking straight at the horse, right? Yeah. Because that's a predator thing, to look straight in the eye like that. Right, right. right. Horses seem to also have some very, um, like, strong connections with their owners. Like, I remember Elaine telling mm -hmm. me, when she comes in, the horse knows her car, she, and then she parks it. the car and the horse is standing right there. Yep, right? Totally, I've seen that. Yep. Yeah. They, I, I mean, they love their food. You can do a lot for horses if they like their food, so they come for food. Yeah. So you don't think it's any affection for the for the owner? I think they know which owner is going to take care of them and give them treats. Yeah. Right. yeah totally. Well, I know you've had where you're walking along with the halter and the horse is trying to put its head in the halter, right? Totally. But yep. that's because they're going to get some grooming, and but some, they're yep, going to get they're some getting treats. a pleasant experience. Right. They know that. Yeah. Exactly. Totally. Yeah. Because I'm sure they like the grooming as well, right? I mean, that's. The, right, and when you're oh, yeah, totally. rushing them yeah. and that, they must totally. enjoy that. Totally, that's a bonding that. session. I mean, and that's important when you're learning to be around horses. When you're grooming, you can keep a hand on the horse. You can tell if he's going to move. So that gives you time, right? So grooming is kind of a bonding and a getting to know each other experience, which is real important, I think. You have told me before about connections in horses and humans related to uh, their health. And mostly about like diet, how you, as the owner of the horse, you know, manipulate its diet, and you can see how the animal responds in those changes in the diet. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, something like that. Like I, I feel that I learned a lot. Like I didn't know anything about my health growing up. Honestly, I was healthy, and I just took it for granted. And as I worked with horses and I learned things about horse health, I started to realize that that was the same for me. And so I learned a lot about my health from horse health. And I know I told you the other day about. Um, I went to my doctor one time and I noticed he had a jar of furison on his counter and I was like, hey, we use that for horses. And so he used it for humans. He did tell me at the time it was becoming an outdated uh, you know, medicine, Method, but, yeah. but it was something he had on his desk, right? I know when my cats and my horses, I have a horse that's on um, pergolide 
Uh, and that's the same drug I believe they use in humans for Parkinson's. Uh, I also have painkillers that are similar, right? Um, so a lot, of the, a lot of the physiology is the same between humans and horses, so it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Cool. and also just changing their feed, right? If they're, oh. if, you know, you can, well, you, one, you manipulate their weight, but you manipulate their vigor, how shiny their coat is, right? Yep. Those kind of things, yep. correct? Yeah, for sure. Just like us, good nutrition equals good health. Um, and I also learned about gut health and gut bacteria from horses. I took a nutrition course, and I realized that there's bacteria in the different areas of the horse's gut, and that each of those bacteria eat a different food. And if you mess that up, like say a horse gets into too much grain, then suddenly the back, the wrong bacteria are eating the wrong food, and that's what causes you know founder or colic, right? And we have the same thing in our guts. We have gut bacteria, and the gut bacteria is actually what gives us vitamins and nutrients, right? It isn't the, it's not the food exactly, it's the poop from the bacteria. Really? Really. really? They they eat that food, and then what they digest and and emit that's our that's our nutrition. Oh, okay. Yep. Well. yep. As long as it works, I guess. Yeah, right? totally. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. There are several aids that you use when you are uh, getting the horse to do what you want it to do. Sure. Right? Yeah. So what? Tell me about those aids. Okay. Well, let's start with horses. Are a um, we do a lot of pressure release, pretty much always for tra training horses. You know, we want to create a little bit of pressure, which is discomfort, where the horse doesn't feel comfortable where he's at, and then when they do the right thing, we release the pressure. Right. So. In that, we have four parts of our body that are called natural aids that you can use to create that pressure. We have our voice, and so our voice can either be soft and soothing, which will calm down an excited animal, or it could be loud and, you know, um, screaming is always a bad thing because the horses tend to do faster things than we want. But we can cluck or kiss and make the horse go forward. Our legs can kick, or they can be off, and that can create movement of some sort. Our hands will pull or release for one rein or two reins for turning or stopping or backing up. And our weight, if you lean forward like a jockey, your horse is more inclined to go fast. If you sit back a little bit, that kind of gets you behind the center of gravity. And so then they're a little more inclined to, to slow down for you. You know, and, and uh, of course they need to be trained that. Horses can also be dulled to those aids. If someone's riding who always applies the aids incorrectly, then the horse can become dull or True. hard. Yeah. And, but part of it, even too, they're very uh, sensitive to this because even with your like the leaning forward or leaning back, a little bit of a, t a twist in your pelvic twist, twist, the horse can sense that totally. and react, totally. right? I always think if you're um, an educated rider, so I kind of look at riding as dancing. You know, when, if you and I started taking some type of dance lesson, tango lessons, at first we'd be stepping all over each other and stuff. So when you first are with a horse, Not oh yeah, I think we would. When you're first with a horse you're going to end up not having really good communication, right? You don't know it, and the horse doesn't understand what you're trying to say, and so the horse tends to wander all over the place, and you're kind of freaking out because you're not doing what you say. And then as you get your skills, you know, hopefully with a, with a certified coach, you, as your skills go up, then maybe you start to have kind of the basic steps of the tango, and you can, you can kind of look decent on the dance floor. You know, you're not doing anything fantastic yet. And then when you get to be really good as a communicator of aids, You'll get, like, remember Catherine and Sheldon from Swing Dance? Yeah, Those two were, they were amazing. amazing. Yeah. They could just, I mean, they're doing a thousand steps a minute, and they're stepping different steps all over the place. There seems to be no communication between the two of them. But they are totally following each other the whole time. And horses, you can get that if you spend the time and you learn your skills. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Well, yeah, totally. And they're, uh, especially the bit in their mouth is the most sensitive. Right? I would say because the mouth is the most sensitive. It's also the one that we rely on last for the most control if the other ones aren't working. So it's also the most sensitive part of the horse. It's easily hardened. A horse is really strong in their jaw, so if you're kind of abusive to that, they can start to push into it like a racehorse does a little bit. They, right. they push into the bit, and they can actually ignore you if you get you know too aggressive and you don't have good cues. Well, you had a bad experience with a racehorse, right? Where it went yeah, crazy. but that had nothing to do with... It was a little but bit of a habitual the, thing. You pulled the bit right out of the horse's mouth, I did, mouth, and he right? still was grunting, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a case where I was exercising racehorses as a kid, and the guy, uh, we had tried to catch the racehorse, and he didn't want to be caught. And so when I got him out to the track, the guy told me to only run him four laps instead of eight. And the horse was having none of it. He was running his eight laps. And when I tried to stop him, uh, I did create some change direction, which ran us through a couple fences, but I didn't. he kept running until he got his eight laps done. Hmm. 
So just he enjoyed the damn eight laps. Well, he, he he was habituated to it, right? right? He always ran his mile, or you know, right. yeah. Right. Cool. Cool. So Corolla, I don't know if I mentioned, competes in a sport called reining, and reining uh, it has a number of maneuvers that you have to put together in the right fashion. So basically, you've got like a run down and then a sliding stop and a roll back and uh, slow circles and fast circles and spins where they spin like left and spin like right. I don't know how they do that without puking because mm -hmm. it's like, oh yeah, it's like, it's, you know what, when you're adult and you swing on a swing, do you ever notice that you feel a little nauseous? Yep. So if you do it every day, after a while that goes away. Right? Okay, fair enough. And maybe that's just being a kid, you do it so much, you don't get nauseous anymore. Right. You're when you're a kid, yeah, and yeah. your kids are, kids don't, I don't know. They're, they're so the problem is, we grow up and we stop doing those things. Totally. If we, we need to be kids things, our whole lives. We need to be kids. That would be one of our health things if we were doing the health part. There, right, right there. Be a kid. That is one the of beginner. the ways to kiss yep, the earth. To be a beginner, right? To be always, a beginner. Always be a beginner. Yeah. Man, we can just stop talking right now. <laughs> That's We've right. already solved one. We've done one, yeah. <laughs> so raining, and there's 10 different patterns, right? Actually, there's more now. Oh, more patterns. Yeah, I can't, I'm not quite up to how many okay, they have well, this year. I gave you the overview. Fill us in the details. Just like that. Yeah, just like that. I started us. I don't know what to say. <laughs> you, you kind of said. Okay. So there's, there's, so, more than so there's patterns. patterns. There's skills. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, there's skills. You need to have circles. You need to have. Right. So reining is all about willfully guided. The horse does. Um, it's like Catherine and Sheldon in the dance club, right? You were doing it, and there's no no seeable communication between you and the horse. Right. Ideally, no the horse, visible cues. The horse should just do what you want and he should be right on track. As if you have a mind As melt. if you two are one animal, right? So you have circles, you have fast circles, you have slow circles. You have lead changes, so when horses are running, they have um, one side of their body, the legs go further ahead than the other side. That's right. a lead. That's a lead. And it's in the direction that the legs are further ahead. So that's a pretty, it's actually a really hard skill to teach a horse. Right, to change the lead. To change the lead, so you have a lead change each way. Uh, you have the spins. There's like, what, 15 steps to the cues to get a lead change? It's like this yeah, it's click, not, it's click, not that click, click, boom, boom. <laughs> that would be in your middle level. Oh, middle level, okay. Uh, you have spins, which is the hind end staying still and the front end pivoting around. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. amazing. That's and, they, pretty and they can be pretty fast. Um, we have some really good rainers in Alberta, and, and if you were to Google, uh, you know, some of them, there would be some really good runs, right? Yeah. Um, you also have sliding stops where the horse's hind feet stay in the ground for, I've seen up to 40 feet. Um, we used to have it's awesome, like in uh, Cardston, they used to have raining shows and they used to have um, a sliding contest to see who could slide the farthest. And I think that's probably where I've seen some of my best stops. Um, but yeah, you do your sliding stops. And that's very dramatic, right? I mean, oh, they're, it's totally they're running awesome. along and all of a sudden just, and you don't see the rider do anything, but all of a sudden their butt just drops and their ass end slides along yep. and they just leave two tracks in the in the sand, right? Yep. And if they do it right, it's, they're, they're parallel all the yep, way through. Yeah, parallel right? and then the horse just stays in this nice frame and then you do a roll back over your tracks, lope off again, yep. and then do it again usually. Yeah, yep. very cool. Yes. Yep. And a backup, and you also have a backup too. Uh, yes, a backup too. Yep. And then Corolla as of late has been, has been I was going to say hiring, but buying more athletic horses. And the one she has right now, Sugar, She's pretty infatuated with I sugar. I do love my sugar. Because yep. he's got power, right? He's like an athlete. He's right? probably, the, for me, the nicest horses I, I've ever ridden. Mm -hmm. The only problem is he's still a stud, and so sometimes he's a little unruly in public yet. But um, he. Why is it that studs are like that? Well, you know what it is about men and oh. their women. <laughs> Bastards. They're all the same. They're all the same, yeah. <laughs> we should probably get on a different topic. Yeah. <laughs> we should probably keep moving. <laughs> yes. So sugar, very very high performance animal. If it was like, uh, like I I don't know what it's like to ride a horse because they're too damn scary. I don't <laughs> ride the horses. But I envision something like you know a Tesla Model S with ludicrous mode when you stand on it. Yeah. Something like something that. Something like that. Yes. You did say the other day when we talked about um, fear and yes. helping people get over their fear that you should come for lessons. Well, you know what? And that was is, a big thing. It was a, it's a valid point. Yeah, I have sworn to this woman that I, she will never, ever see me on the back of a horse again. But the other night when we were chatting about it, I remembered this terrible experience that I had first time ever on a horse, right? Yeah. And my dad, great man, great man. Not very empathetic in that situation. Not very empathetic. No. Not much of a horse trainer or a person trainer, a rider yeah. and racing trainer, right? Well, probably not anything, right? No. Yeah. In that regard, he probably didn't have a clue. Uh, so... So anyways, maybe, maybe I'm going to reconsider. Maybe I'm yeah. going to go and get a lesson from you. 
Do you know, like, you're talking about when you were a kid and yes. you know, had this bad experience. When I was a teenager, I looked for help in this area, and there's very few people at that time who were um, skilled at teaching lessons. And so, you know, we're really lucky now. We have so many wonderful coaches and even trainers who, you know, are successful in their fields who can teach people. We're so much more, there's so much more resource now to draw on for, you know, horse, horse education. Right. Yeah. Corolla, one of her things in being a, a Canadian quote, coach is that you can train people up to a certain level, right? right? Up to the four riders, is that what it's called? Yeah, I can help people get either their instructor or their competition coach with Equine Canada, because I'm an Equine Canada competition coach. Right. Yeah. So she can teach people to get to that level. Yep. Or is a level below you? How's it work? It's a level below me. Right. Well, there's, there's a couple two. of, yeah, I'm, well, I'm level one, but there's r four rider levels in my level, and so I can help people through those four. Yes. And then after that, there's other things that they still have to do to become either an instructor or a coach. And they would have to qualify with somebody else. Is that how it works? Yes. You prep yes. them. I can prep them, but you, I can't. You cannot qualify And them. I mean, that's all good, right? right. Even, even my student, I can only teach to, or I can only test to rider three. Right. And then rider four, another coach comes in in case I miss something. Right. Or in case I tend to really like that student and want them to pass. Right. Right? So that way then it catches, you know, any little things that that student still needs. It, it, it creates for more consistency in those results, totally. right? Totally, yep. You're going to want to make sure that they teach them, they know it well, if they're coming for me to get qualified. Exactly. Right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Cool. cool. I'm also um, a centered, centered riding level one coach. Right. And so I'm. I really like this. It really helped my coaching. It's all about using your body well, so that you can use your body until you're 100 years old. You say centered riding right away. I change my posture. You sat straighter. straighter. Yeah. yeah. And you know we were talking about weight earlier, right? Yeah. And so a horse has a center of gravity, and it tend, It's basically kind of right under us, just a little bit in front of us and under us, right? And so our center of gravity is when we're sitting somewhere in our belly button area. And so we want those two center of gravities to be together, mm. right? And so if you get ahead of that center of gravity, that makes the horse, you know, kind of heavier in the front, which makes, that's why he goes faster, because the front end is running, you know, to kind of get that weight, right? Okay, and you're just sitting back, to handle that weight, to manage Exactly, that weight. and if okay. you sit back, then the weight is behind, which is kind of making him fall back, you know, so, so that so center of gravity. There, yeah, being there, you're basically kind of, again, sort of in tune with the, totally. with your, your horse, right? Yeah. That you're in sync with the horse in terms of the body weight oh. distribution. So you have that, then you have your side to side, right? That you want to be balanced side right. to side. You want to have, um, we've done some Alexander Technique um, yeah. stuff, which is really cool. Um, basically, the tenets of Alexander Technique that we've learned so far are to free the neck, um, to have your head go up and forward, and then to lengthen your spine, length, uh, widen your shoulders, and widen your hips. And I kind of look at that as if, you know, people out there who might be a little bit more uh, educated about horses will know about collection. And collection is kind of about getting that back up and getting that neck around. So you've got that lengthening of the back, same kind of idea, head forward and, you know, kind of a stretch to the neck. And then you're using your core and you're much more ready to do your next mover, you know, if you're a yeah. gymnast, to do your next gym movement, right? right? Whatever, yeah. right? Yeah. And for a human as well, that's this is more engaging for your core too, right? Totally. Like you know, so your body is more prepared to do something, right? right. To move to. Well, and it's going to be, yeah. you know, like um, in the old days, we were all. I remember when I was a kid and I did have a riding lesson. Um, they had me to sit straight. They took a broom. I brought my elbows back, and I had a broomstick stuck behind my elbows, behind my back through my elbows. I see, like well, that. that's not a very good position. No. Your back is hunched, right? Is arched straight, and you're not you're not um, really capable of taking a trauma, right? Right, because your muscles are going to get hurt, right? So when you're in the right frame, you're way more likely to stay sound or healthy if something happens. To Makes you, good right? sense. And stay with your horse if he jumps or right, 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 yeah. right, right. Yeah, be positioned so that you're yeah. you're following him with your body so, weight and how it's yeah. distributed. That makes good sense. We also, this sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, we also need to make sure we're relaxed, right? Like, if, right. if you have to fake it, that's good. You know, that's what I always tell my students. If you don't feel relaxed, try and pretend you're relaxed. Because, you know, it's A lot to relaxation. do with the breathing with the Alexander Technique totally. as well. Totally, yeah. When we took it, I took it for more from singing, and Corolla took it more for riding. Totally. But basically, this Alexander guy, like, was in, what, 1890 or something like that? And it was like he was a performer, and he couldn't perform consistently. He lost his voice, didn't lost he? Lost his voice. Yeah, he kept on losing yeah. his voice. And so, and, and all that, what solved his problem was changing his posture, um, focusing more on his breath, and those things 
kind of built his his structure, like his diaphragm and his core, and and his his capacity that he could project very well and retain his voice, right? Exactly. And, that yep. was kind and of so like, now lots of actors <laughs> or singers do use the Alexander technique to improve, right? You know, especially the projection, and right. Such, right? And it's such small little adjustments, really. In your body, right? yeah. You know, it's just like, and and you don't believe you're doing it until you have you look in the mirror and say, oh shit. <laughs> yeah. I see it, yeah. Yeah. It's like my singing coach. She does the same thing. I don't think I'm doing it. Then she points out, oh, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That kind of takes me to um, maybe not horses, but I have been doing um, a course on Bateco breathing. Bateco breathing. Bateco breathing. Um, I've, been, I've been joining in, her, in some of the exercises, yeah. following along. So it's really an interesting thing and um, something maybe people would be interested in. If you look it up, um, there's a guy from Ireland who teaches some of it on the internet, and his, and his um, handle is Oxygen Advantage. And basically, the take of breathing, there was a doctor in Russia, and he was the head of the respiratory thing for Sputnik, and he found that most people hypo, hyperventilate all the time. And usually it's because of our stressful lives and stuff, and we're just breathing too much. And so when you breathe too much, the oxygen in your body gets tightened. It's too tight in the blood, into the red blood cells, and it can't release. You need a little carbon dioxide there. And so you have to learn to slow your breathing. And uh, so it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. I'm smiling because now I'm, I'm thinking now about you're... my posture and my breathing. <laughs> I'm breathing through my, my nose only. Right. Being a little more right. So, so with the Bateco, you do want to, you want to, um, a lot of people in our stressful lives now breathe with their mouth instead of their nose. So you want to do all your breathing through your nose. And you want to have diaphragmic breathing. So you always want to breathe down into your diaphragm. If you're breathing into your chest, it's shallow, and you're not, you're not getting um, good use of your diaphragm. And the diaphragm, when you breathe, actually massages your internal organs. It's amazing. So, singing. That's why singing is so good yeah. for you. Yeah. So those are, those are the main two things about uh, the potato breathing. And slower. Slower breathing. You yeah. don't want to breathe as fast. And there was something about uh, nitric oxide or something, wasn't it? There yeah, when you breathe through your nose, somehow you have more nitric oxide, and that's you know kind of like the same the glycerin pills that you take for heart attack or nitric oxide, so it helps have more nitric oxide in your bloodstream. If I recall correctly, the nitric oxide uh, affects the the lining of the blood vessels, right? right? The Opens them up. Endothelial cells, is that what they're called? Maybe. I don't know. The lining on those and makes them more pliable, right? That they can open That's and right, that they're more right? elastic. And yep. then that gives you a whole bunch more flexibility in how your body can deliver blood, oxygenated blood throughout your body. So, anyway, it's a very cool idea. And there is one test that uh, I know it's on the internet, so I think I'm not supposed to teach right. anything because I'm just a student, but um, I'm sure this is on the internet, so they do have, if you look up Oxygen Advantage, they have um, instructions for how to do a comfort pause. And a comfort pause tests to see how... So what happens because we hyperventilate is we become insensitive to CO2. And so we um, are breathing too much. And so you need to become more sensitive to having the CO2 so that you don't have to breathe as much. And so they have a comfort pause where you have a natural breath in and natural breath out. Exhale fully and then plug your nose and hold it for however long till you feel the urge to breathe. And then basically they say if you are less than 25 you need to work on this because you are likely to have some some type of illness in your body. Some failure of health. Some failure of health. Long term. Yep. Yep. Yes. And so it's uh, it's quite interesting. Yeah. Now, she Crowley researches all kinds of different things this way, and a lot of times I think they're pretty wacky. Mm -hmm. But when I try them, which I've been doing more as of late, they're pretty smart actually. Do you remember the whole uh, uh, Qigong thing? Yeah, I was going to become a chi. Qigong instructor. Qigong, and, Qigong, same yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so I, I did the first course on my own, and then you were like, oh, that sounds like silly stuff. And so then we did uh, the rest of the courses, and um, you know what? In the end, I, I, Qigong is good. I'm not sure if I like it 100%, but Al does it every day now. I'm in. And he came in for the second class, and he started. He took all the classes I took as well. Exactly. So now he does it every day. I still do it every now and then, but not near as often anymore as you do. You know, one of my favorite things about doing Qigong What's that? is the goofy names they give you. <laughs> yeah. They've got these different postures you do, and the idea is you coordinate your breathing with the posture, right? And so one is like, fly like a wild goose, <laughs> <laughs> or punch with intense eyes. I was like... What the hell is intense <laughs> eyes? And then there's one though on that other one. 
after all of these goofy things that they call things, right? You know, open morning glory and blah, 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 all these different phrases. One is, bed forward and back. <laughs> well, that looks pretty easy, actually, right? At least bed forward and back. Like, everything else had to have this fancy title, but bed yep. forward and back. Anyways. So Corolla comes up with a whole bunch more ideas, and then often, often what I'll do is, I'm a little reluctant, first of all, mm -hmm. then I try them. Oh, there's some merit in that. Even small stuff. She was telling me for 25 years that we should make our bed. And I always said, we're going to sleep in it tonight. Forget making the bed. We don't need it. And then finally she convinced me to help her make the bed. And now, every night you go up by the bedroom, oh, it looks all so neat and tidy. And then you go to bed and you pull the covers back and get under. It's a very pleasant experience. It's awesome. It's like being in a hotel. It is. It is, yeah. You're it's a cool. smart woman. I Sometimes it works. Yeah. All right. What else? What else do you want to talk so, about with horses? So, uh, well, one last thing with horses. I was thinking about it the other day because I had a horse. I don't know if you guys all know, but we had a thousand mile an hour winds here yesterday, and uh, they were bad. Yeah. Oh. If you saw, I posted on Facebook a picture of our road while I was driving down, and you, the visibility was like this far in front of you. Like there's so much dust. So anyway, one of my horses, who is n named Nellie because she's quite nervous, so nervous Nellie, which I know, not the right name. Should have given her confident Kate or something. Oh, that would have been um, But she, uh, a pl piece of plastic flew into her pen and stuck on the thing, and she freaked out. She ended up ripping the crap out of her blanket, and even after we took the blanket off, she was running up and down, and this went on for about an hour, and I was worried that she was going to colic or something because she had so much emotional trauma. And colic, just kidding. Colic is basically a stomach disorder that horses get, and because they can't vomit, that's right. And if they're if they're blocked, if they have an intestinal blockage, any reason blockage, it can't go through, they're they in trouble. Die. Yeah. They're, well, they don't die, but it's in trouble. It's definitely trouble. In the vet book, colic, die. Yeah. That's how it works. <laughs> Sometimes it feels that way. Okay. Anyway, she. So I decided to take her, and I took her down the arena. I actually rode her for a bit and gave her some direction, and uh, just gave her some confidence about life. And then I brought her back out, put her in the pen, and she relaxed. And my big thought about the whole situation was about her emotional needs. She's a pretty sensitive horse, and she needs people around her who are able to give her confidence. And just like some people need people around them that give them confidence, sure. and some horses are really confident. I have one horse, I'm walking down the road, that big piece of plastic actually hit that horse on the leg, similar piece, of course, and he never missed a beat, just kept walking, right? So he has lots of his own confidence, so he doesn't need as much from his human handler. So I think another skill that a handler needs to have is to be aware of the emotional need of, needs of the horse that they have or the horses that they're taking care of. Because some are just that much more sensitive and they need more help from you sure. to give them confidence. And it, like, so like you had made the, made the reference to a human as well, right? right. People have yeah. different levels of support and encouragement that they need, yeah. right? So, I mean, that makes perfect yeah, sense. Totally. And sometimes the, if the animal is a little bit more timid, the yeah. animal gets the attention they need, then they become, like, more, uh, I don't know, if happy. Do horses get I think happy? they're more comfortable. Like, comfortable. I think animal, horses, animals are looking for comfort and security in their lives. Right. And so if they feel like they know what the situation is at all times, they, are in they feel somewhat in control, and then they're healthier because of it. Right. right. Just like you said about where... You came if you went home to like an alcoholic parent, and you mm -hmm. knew what was going to happen. You are always sitting right. on the edge, right? Right. Where the horse and wants that same kind of a comfort totally. level with their owner, yep. where their owner is going to be, you know, someone who you know cares for them on a consistent basis, doesn't lose their shit and whip them or something right. like and, that. And 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 that's where some horses are ruined, or maybe they're with maybe not ruined, but they're with the wrong handler. If that handler, I know people who um, <clears throat> they need to get confidence from the horse, and if they had a horse like Nelly they would clash because Nellie needs confidence from the rider and the two of them would just end up being a mess. Right. right. And if the horse is timid and the trainer is aggressive, they're gonna they could damage sometimes, that they could horse. damage the right. confidence of that horse as well. Possibly. If the horse was yep. uh, horse was like aggressive, like more of an alpha horse yep. or whatever, and the trainer was aggressive, that would probably work. That'd then probably have some that. success. But not so much if it was a timid person because right. the horse would could end up being dangerous, right? Makes sense. Yep. Makes yeah. sense. Hmm. So yeah, that's. I think that that's real important, you know, I to be so aware too. of your horse's emotional needs as well. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So you have that. You have you know, um, what they eat is important. We talked about bacteria and making sure that you know horses need hay and and water and salt are kind of their basics. And then if you want to add supplements and other things, those are you know enhancers, not right. necessary, but they can enhance the health of your horse, right? And so they those are basics. And then they have to have a safe environment, right? Emotionally and physically. 
right? You don't want to have machinery in there, corrals right. or things, right, that they could get caught on. So right. you want to have, you know, safety in their environment as well. Right. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And they, they also uh, want each other, right? Horses, horses, horses want to have do, They are together, social right? animals. They're, they do don't like do to well if they're by themselves, yeah. right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. Cool. Corolla, back in the day, when we had not so many horses as we have now, we used to make our own hay. We did, and we won awards for it, too. That's what I was just going to say. Yeah. And it was because of Corolla <laughs> that we won awards. Because <laughs> yeah. I was like, screw that, I'm not waiting. Saturday, I've got time right now, I'm failing this shit. And she said, whoa, no, whoa, whoa, no, we no, want no. good hay, we can't do that. So the first year we put up hay and we sold some to our neighbor. Yeah. And uh, his son entered our hay in the local, in the Ag, Ag Expo. Ag Expo. Yeah. And we won grand champion. We won the top of our of our category, and then we won overall all of them too. So then after that, we decided to start entering every year. Oh, yeah. And we, we would win something every year, uh, but then we stopped entering. Oh, and we man. stopped making our own hay, too, which is a hay. lot of work, oh. believe me. Hay. Having it delivered, much easier. And haying is so frustrating, and so it's kind of like where you go and you cut it, you watch the weather forecast as best as you can determine what's going to happen in the weather for the next few days and how fast that hay is going to dry. Then you cut it, and then you leave it for a little bit, and then it, you might go, okay, I can, I can do it now. I can do it now. No, nope, it's not dry enough, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And yep. then we have the moisture tester and test the... the uh, the furrows oh, to see where it and is. And then you look at the sky and it's black and you're like, we got to bail it now because if we don't get it off now, it's never coming. Exactly. Yeah. I remember where it was like a crazy, crazy hot day, like 35 degrees, and we're out there humping these bales like crazy. Yeah, just about passing the, out in the... Yeah, yeah, just about passing out from all the heat because we could see the clouds yeah. coming. And we'd so, be putting hay in the barn as the yeah. rain started, right? Oh, yeah. it was just like brutal. And you'd feel like, well, you'd be tired. Oh, Man, yeah. do you ever sleep good? Right? Oh, yeah. But you'd be... Pizza and beer tasted pretty good. Pizza too. and beer did taste yeah. pretty awesome. <laughs> but you'd be all sweaty and the hay would stick to you and just you'd feel itchy everywhere. Yeah. Oh, and, and uh, we, I don't think we did this according to occupational health and safety standards. But remember with the, with the old blue truck there. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, yes. With that truck, then basically what we would do is, like, there'd be rows of bales here, right? We had a, a 1956 New Holland baler. We still have it, actually. A 1956... Did it bale the bales tight enough to pick them up with a pickup wagon? Exactly. Yeah. It used that sizal twine, not the polytine, but the sizal twine. And so it wouldn't do that. So it uh, wouldn't pick them up. But then we had that old Ford, Gary... And because I was picking it up all by myself, because you didn't want to pick up hay... What? We would let that Ford just drive down along the field, and I would run behind and throw bales on the way. Yeah, we just put it in first gear, yep. low range, and no, no driver, and just let it go along. And then every once in a while, I'll run up there and change the steering wheel <laughs> a little bit, and then go back and throw the bales on the trailer. Yeah, right? yeah it was that a lot was fun. hard, hard work. That was hard work. Whew. Remember uh, the one year we got um, a football team to help, and you would think that uh, a football team could outwork me. Yes. But it turns out they can't. They can They can last for the first hour pretty good, and then they're done. And uh, about an hour in, they're like, how much longer are we doing this? And I'm like, yeah, pretty much all day. <laughs> oh, man. I tell you what, sometimes I feel guilty. I don't know if I've told you this before. I'll be sitting in the hot tub, singing some songs, and thinking about how am I going to introduce this song, and I'll see Corolla go by. Then she comes back again. Then she's going to uh, has a halter. And then she has a horse. And then she's carrying some lumber. And then she's running a wheelbarrow. <laughs> and she's just going all day. And I'm watching her. And it's just like he's exhausted. I'm exhausted <laughs> watching her. So every once in a while, I try and encourage her. You know, I say, what do I say to you? I sing to you. You ought to have your picture on a magazine, because you're the hardest working woman I've ever seen. Yeah, that's exactly what he sings. And I'm so far away, I don't know what she's doing exactly. I think she's saying, yay, good job. <laughs> yeah, Is yeah. that what you're doing? I think... I think sometimes I speak with my fingers, but oh, I'm not going to show now. <laughs> oh, I see how it is with you. I thought I was being encouraging there. Damn. So before we finish up with the horse part, I, yes. I do want to say, like, if you are a person who's, you know, looking at having yourself or a child involved with horses, the first thing I'd recommend is finding a reputable um, coach that you can go for lessons with. Because you really need to get some skills before you get that first horse. Makes sense. Right? And then when you're looking for your first horse, you know, expect to spend a little bit of money. You know, these days I would say, you know, between three and $5,000. Um, have your coach help you because, you know, they're going to uh, have more experience and, you know, horses. Look for a co horse that's suitable to your 
what you want to do with a horse. You know, if you want to do trail riding, don't buy a barrel horse, you know, because they're not going to work out. Um, Got to do the job you need it to do. Totally. Right. And, and having said that, for a beginner, sometimes a horse that has a slight imperfection is still a good horse for someone who's not going to do that much yet, right? Right. Um, Cost-wise for horses, you're probably looking at um, roughly between $350 and $500 a month in, in boarding. Um, horses' teeth need to be done about once a year. Their teeth grow all the time. So you think so about So they that. have to be filed down every now and then. Sorry to inter interrupt one thing. Where Coral was just talking about how much the board was, right? When you go to buy the horse, like the That's buying the, the horse is part. the cheapest part, yeah. right? And if you buy a horse that is not a good horse, it's going to be frustrating as hell, right? Yeah, it is. Whereas if you buy a horse that is has the right temperament, the right suitability of the sport you want to do, and has the training, because remember, the horse has to learn the cues, and then the rider Learns knows the cues, the cues and then they, they, they match, right? right? I know this cue means this. The horse and rider got it together, right? So having said that, you know, yes. uh, we call horses that are untrained green horses, and we call people that are untrained green riders, and green and green equals black and blue. Oh, good one. Nice one. Yeah, so, um, and then, so going back to the cost, you have yes. about between 350 and 500 for a board. If you're probably going to board a horse, you'll buy your acreage in a year or two, probably, which is another, you know, five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000, but we won't get there yet. <laughs> nope. So, um, and then the truck and the trailer. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. it never ends. So teeth, horses' teeth grow all the time, and because they grind their teeth like this, sometimes if they don't meet up really well, they'll get shock points which can affect, you know, when you're using the bit with them, and so... In the have, wild, they have much coarser feet, is that correct? Yeah. And then I, that doesn't happen? I would think, too, that probably horses that don't have as good teeth are probably eventually taken out by predators. Too. Right, they just don't live as long. Yeah. Right, so we're interrupt. Okay. So go ahead. So, so that's, you know, probably about $200 a year. Uh, you have vaccines, which is probably roughly $100 a year. You have farrier work, so a horse's feet grow, uh, just like our, they're kind of like our fingernails, and so they need to be done every six to eight weeks. And you're looking at somewhere between 55 and 100, 180 dollars, depending on shoes. You know whether you have shoes or barefoot, and whether what type, like rainers, and to spend more because we have special shoes put on the hind feet for the slide slide stops. Excuse me. And so you know you're looking at that expense as well every six to eight weeks. And then hopefully you have no health issues ever. But that can cost, you know, that can create a cost if your horse gets cut or something happens. But those are things you want to factor in when you do your first horse. Well, really, if you don't, then you're not really taking care of the animal properly, are you? Probably like not. If you're yep. not. If you're not doing the farrier work on a regular basis, right. then their hooks grow out, they have health problems, they have walking problems, they're in pain, right? That well, kind of thing. And a lot of things is, that, is just like us for, you know, say we eat hamburgers and pop all the time, right? You don't, you feel good today, it doesn't feel that bad. But maybe in 10 years, 15 years, you end up, you're obese, you might have heart issues, you might have diabetes, right? So, right. Like, so sometimes here and what, yeah, yeah, they yeah. do make a difference down the road. And right. definitely what you're, you know, how you feed your horse, how you take care of your horse. Don't want them too fat, don't want them too thin, right? right. Uh, you need to keep their feet done. You know, those are definitely uh, real important for long-term health. Of the horse. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I feel like I'm doing something right. I have four lesson horses right now that are 27 years old. I have one who's retired, he's over 30. And 27 is old, like most horses In, in the be... old days, like when I was younger, 20 was a good age for a horse. Right. And, and now we make the them to about 30. And probably in the wild, they live I, five, I don't six know. years. Yeah, I don't know for sure how long. Yeah. I think there are some that are older. Really? Claudia, one of my boarders, oh, does right. a lot of um, research. Claudia Notsky, she does, she's written books and she does research on wild horses. And she would be able to answer that question for us. Yeah. She would. She'd probably be able to show me pictures of 27 hand high horses. Too she might, yeah. yeah. If she blew the picture up really big. <laughs> okay, what else do we don't want to talk about? Um, do you want to try your joke? Oh, I don't know. You were going to tell the joke. No, you were going to tell the joke. <laughs> All right, we'll try. And you can help me if I, because I'm horrible okay, I'll tell at telling you what, jokes. You get it together, I'm going to tell you one more thing. Well, I'm going to tell okay. them, our audience, one more thing. Do you remember when I said Google can't answer all the questions? Here's another example how Google can't do it. There's a song by Omar and the Howlers called Jealous Heart. If you look it up on Google, let's try it right now. Try it right now. Hey Google, play the song Jealous Heart by Omar and the Howlers. Your Google is not doing anything today. Google's She's very, very lazy. Talking. No. What is she doing? She on strike or something? Got so what, what's your point here exactly? Oh, man, that was a long way to go for this. But anyways, 
All I'm saying is, it's not on Google, but the song exists. Oh, I see. You see? Okay. That, and it's a song called, we saw them live, Omar and the Hollywood, mm -hmm, right? We did, yeah. And it goes like, my jealous heart drove you away. Now I must suffer for my mistakes. <laughs> Something like that. It's a cool song. Pretty good there. All right. Thank you. Um, okay, we're so going to try this. Here comes Please forgive joke. me if I screw it up. Troll is okay. going to ace this. Let's so, have it, so uh, a pastor was looking for a horse, and he saw an ad that said Christian horse for sale. And so he goes up and he's like, Christian horse, what's, you know, sounds like my kind of horse, but explain this to me. And so the horse, uh, he gets on the horse and the guy says, now, when you want to go forward, you don't cluck or anything, you say, praise the Lord. And so the guy says, praise the Lord, and the horse goes forward. And he says, now, when you want to stop, you say, amen. And so the guy says, the pastor says, amen, and the horse stops. So this is all good. The pastor buys a horse, takes him home. And so one day he's out riding the horse and uses praise the Lord. And the horse goes forward and a, they counter a rattlesnake. And so the horse takes off towards a cliff. And uh, the horse is running, running, and, and he's yelling, whoa, whoa, when the horse doesn't stop. And then he, he remembers, amen. So he yells out, amen, and this horse stops just on the edge of the cliff. And the pastor is so happy, he puts his hands up in the air and he yells, praise the Lord. <laughs> I did it! Nailed it! Nailed it! All righty, sounds good. Uh, what else do we want to talk? We talked well, about the cost of horses. We yep. talked about. Oh, you know one thing I wanted to add into Crow's thing. Remember, you said don't buy the first horse, right? right? And I can. This is analogous, not the same, but similar. Even people who I come, who uh, take my firearm safety course and want to shoot a handgun, then what I'll do is I'll say, hey. Try these six different ones. Right. How does it fit in your hand? Yep. How does it feel when you fire it? You know how you know how accurate are you with it? You know how totally. just yep. it, and those are small things. You think what? You just grab the grip. It's real simple. But that little bit of difference, if they try it, yep. they ultimately make a way better purchase. Something totally. they're going to yep. use that they're not going to hate shooting, and then it sits in their safe, or in your case, yep. hate riding, and it just sits out in the field. And that's a really good reason for lessons because, like I have. You know, seven or eight lesson horses. They're all different. Some of them are a little bit timid to go forward. You have to work a little bit harder. And some of them, you know, they go at a moment's notice and so, like, with a slight cue, right? So riders can determine which ones. Some people who are um, a little bit nervous, you know, they make a lot of extra movements. Those fast horses aren't good for them. You need a horse that's a little more forgiving, a little bit more dollar. And so if they accidentally bump, the horse doesn't take off, right? Right. So, so same thing if you take lessons, you get to try. A lot of different animals right before you buy a horse and you kind of get to know I would get really frustrated number one if I had to spend five you know five hours trying to catch the horse before right so you want a horse that's easy to catch right um, and if you have to work really hard and say you have bad knees or something you don't want to be kicking the crap out of your horse every time you want to make them go and so. part of that is a function of who trained the horse or who the well, and, owner and horse personalities I have some horses that are like that's what makes a beginner horse is a dollar horse does make a good beginner horse right because they can take that extra kick or something and they don't run away right. I don't know if you remember we had a boarder um, oh we had lots of boarders but we had one lady who boarded with us and she was very very beginner to horses and she bought a horse that had been a rope horse and one day uh, I'm not sure she hadn't ridden him for a while and she went out I don't know why she went out that day and rode the horse and when she cued him he took off on her ended up running through a fence and she had ended up um, breaking a rib that punctured her lung. It was just too sensitive a horse for her. He knew too much. And the horse ended up later on with a roper who said this was the best horse he ever owned, right? So it just goes to show you need the right horse for each rider. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, another thing I was going to mention about feed too. You might have heard about horse people being really, really picky about their feed, their hay that they buy, right? And that's definitely true. But here, if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Cattle, we're going to eat the same feed, right? But cattle are expected to live, I don't know, how long? Two years before six they get... Six months to a year or so. Six months yeah. to a year before they get butchered and end up on somebody's plate, right? So you don't really care if they can't breathe well. Right. You don't, yeah. You're, not, you're not feeding them for performance, right? No. Whereas a horse, you're feeding for performance. Right, exactly. You're With cows, you're just feeding so they get fat as possible, so that you get as much meat to sell as possible. Yeah. With horses, they're a performance animal that you want them to be... Uh, have good lung capacity, totally. good performance, so that they can engage in their sports properly, right? So, yep. So yeah. that kind of brings me a little bit to that beginner rider who's looking for a horse, and now you've found a horse, where to keep it? You want to get a, a facility. Um, AEF has some approved facilities on their website. 
Um, or look in your area and see if there's, a, you know, facilities that you're happy with. But the corral should be safe. There shouldn't be, you know, things poking out that are going to injure the horse. The area should be safe. You know, you should have a, a, a closed in, you know, your arenas to ride in. We have an indoor arena. We have an outdoor arena. We have a trail course that are all fenced in and they're safe and there's no obstacles that are going to injure you or your horse. Um, you want to take a look at the feed that the that the stable is feeding. Make sure it's clean, not moldy or dusty, because that can impair your horse's lungs and such, right? And then de just depending on what care level of care, you have your basic care, which I kind of call myself a deluxe backyard border because I don't do box stalls, which is where the horses are housed inside and have their own individual little room. Uh, or I do more, uh, I do outside pens and outside pastures. And pastures, to me, are the most healthy for a horse. Sure, they right? have more room to move yeah. and yeah, that kind of thing. So one those thing, are some thing, things you want to look for when you're looking for your facility. One thing you'd be surprised is how easy horses can get hurt. Oh man! Our place, man, we like. I mean, we it doesn't happen very often, but it still happens. Yeah. And it's like if you could if you could have a rubber room for a horse, that's about as close as our place is. It's kind of like mud. You know what? They'll find mud where there's none, and same with injury. They seem to find an injury in the safest place. I don't believe it. Yeah. We've got these. They're drill stem rails and then sucker rod. And so it's both smooth pipes, right? So how can a horse hurt himself on smooth pipe? Yeah, but it well, happens if a thousand it. pounds runs into any time, anything, sure. they're going to get injured. Right? And sometimes that's another thing, too, that you are very, very cautious about which horses to put together with which mm -hmm. horses. Totally, right? yeah. Because if you just say, screw it, put this one in there, they'll figure it out. Yeah. They will, but somebody could get hurt, right? Yeah. And often do, right? So about kind of having them across, well, you often quarantine new animals that come in. Yeah, right? I, so, I, that, I was going to mention that. Yeah. You know, we're just talking about coronavirus, and, and Al were. and I were talking about how probably isolation is going to be the key to, to overcome the coronavirus at some point. Um, and I do the same thing with my horses. When they've been off-site, they come back, or a new horse comes in, they're quarantined for at least 14 days before they go into the herd again, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. So Corolla is very, very good about making sure that horses play nice with each other, right? Mm -hmm. And if if there's two studs that or two geldings, let's say, yeah. you're not going to put two studs together. But if you have two geldings you want to put together, lots of times you'll put them over the fence for a little bit so that they can kind of get their snorting and, and whining and all their stuff. So they get to know each other, right? Like, yeah. you know, sometimes it's hard to room with somebody you don't know, but once you know them a little bit, it's a little easier, right? Exactly. Yeah. And they have to determine, horses do have a pecking order, they have a leader, and then they have a second, a third, and a fourth. Most of the time, sometimes I've seen kind of weird orders, but usually it goes one, two, three, four. And so, you know, they have to determine who's going to be the lead horse, who's going to be the second, the third, and the fourth. And so that takes a little bit of time for them to work that out. Exactly. And lots of times, it, when you bring a new horse into the dynamic, that changes entirely, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. Cool. What else you got for horses? I'm going to sing a song before we go, Ooh. too, you know? Um... I think that's just about, you know, we're doing pretty good here. I think we got most of the stuff I had down here. Nice. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Yep. Yeah. What's this one say? That's the one about the emotional health. Uh -huh. Yeah, and we did right. that. Yeah. Okay. I always find it surprising where she'd be walking around the halter and the horse is trying to get its head in the halter. Yeah. So I realize it's food, but it's more than that. I know. You like to think they love you too. That's well, the horse must <laughs> like some kind of attention. Well, right? they do. I do know sometimes when I train horses that I can tell if the horse. Um, feels comfortable with their owner or not, right? Like, you know, right. after I've trained it for a bit, he's pretty comfortable with me, and the ones that were comfortable with their owner, they, they're still comfortable with their owner. Right. But the ones who weren't will kind of gravitate back to me a little bit, right? Because right. they're like, this person kind of has her shit together, and we kind of know that we can. she's she's reliable and she's consistent, and so I kind of like how she does things, and hopefully she'll teach my owner how to do that. Right. right? Yeah. Well, you've had situations where a lot of times Corolla will use like a round pen, to have, and lunging, a lot of lunging, right? Lunging, I was taking a sip of your water. Were you? <clears throat> yeah, we're sharing it now. I guess we are. So they would lunge in circles until basically you use the horse's lung capacity as something to draw them to you, right? Is that yeah. correct? That they you, use, you use that, yeah, to and, do some training. Right. right. And then, and so anyway, she creates this bond with the horse, and then so she might train the horse for a while, and then the owner of the horse comes back, and the horse will kind of like stick right on her side kind of yeah. thing, okay? So that's happened before. It has, yep. yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Totally. Yes. What else? Anything else? Um, yeah, I think we're pretty close here. Pretty yeah, close? we're pretty close, yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to sing a song. Okay. And then you think, and if there's something else, then you let me know. Okay. Okay, we'll add it in. Okay, sounds so good. So you know what song I'm going to sing? No. 
a song that I think you're going to like. Okay. You ready? It sings the six ten. Sixteen Ooh, times. I like that. Song. Okay, I knew you did. <laughs> Some people say a man is made out of mud. A poor man is made out of muscle and blood. A muscle and blood and skin and bones With a mind that's weak and a back that's strong He loads 16 tons, what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt St. Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go I owe my soul to the company store I was born one morning when the sun didn't shine I picked up my shovel and I walked to the mine. I loaded 16 tons of number nine coal. And the straw ball said, well, I bless my soul. He loaded 16 tons. What do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. Saying, Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. I was born one morning in the drizzling rain. A fighting and trouble on my middle knees. I was raised in the Cambridge pound on Mama line. Ain't no high tone woman made me walk the line. I loaded sixteen tons. What do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. Saint Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. If you see me coming, better step aside. A lot of men didn't, and a lot of men died. On oh, one fist iron, the other is steel, <laughs> the other is steel. If the left one don't get you, then the right one will. I loaded 16 tons. What do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me, cause I can't go. I owe my son to the company store. Oh, St. Peter, don't you call me. Cause I can't go, I owe my soul to the company store. Very nice. Thank Good you. job. I love that song. Oh, yeah, thanks. So I did I want forgot to, the lyrics. Myself. I know, but you, you picked it up really good. It was very nicely done. All right. Well, you I, did, I just want to say last thing. Um, if you're looking for a coach, you can go to the Alberta Equestrian Federation website um, and go under Find a Coach. It's under education and resources, I believe. Mm. You'll it, it takes a little bit of digging, but you'll find yeah, and uh, and find coaches in your area, and so you can get the names of coaches that are in your area that are co certified through Equine Canada. Yeah. You know what? I'm not going to talk about it tonight, today, but I dreamed of a new Google product. Oh. Yeah. You're not going to talk about it. It's, it's a right surprise for, for later. Another exactly. another session. Yeah. Cool. Exactly. I think it'll be a way to kiss the earth, actually. Nice. So. What was the way to kiss the earth we discovered today? What was that again? Oh man, that was a long time ago already. No. It was earlier on here, yeah. Brent, do you remember? <laughs> I'll put you on the spot. Do you remember? <laughs> no. Anyways, we can look back. And That's right. Well, so, we'll have I to thought we thought of something. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, anyways, thank you for coming. We're going to be back here next Wednesday at five thirty for another issue, another version of One Thousand Ways. I uh, look forward to seeing you then. If you have comments, love to share them. And thank right. you to Jess FM. Thank you to Jess FM. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I want to interview Jesse Parmar, but he's too shy. He won't mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. But I think he would be awesome because we've had nice chats with Jesse. He's a good man. Yeah. 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 All right. Thanks. Thanks. See you guys.